For this video, we're going to turn to the final fall of the Roman Empire in the West. In 394, Theodosius marched to Italy and defeated the barbarian general Arbogast, who had overthrown the Western Emperor. This shows how powerful the barbarians had become. The Roman armies were far from the monolithic force they had been before. They were far less reliable. They were far more reliant on barbarian mercenaries, barbarians also serving as generals in the Roman army. And so Theodosius becomes the last man to rule the Eastern and Western empires together before his death a year later. He divided the empire between his sons, Arcadius and Honorius, both of whom were incompetent. And from now on, the two halves of the empire are going to go their separate ways. They're going to have the same laws and the same currency, but the governments aren't really going to interact. The two halves of the empire were so divided that officials in the eastern half of the empire encouraged Alaric and the Visigoths to go, one of these Gothic tribes, to go to the west. He arrives in Italy in 405, and the Romans no longer have the strength to resist him. The Romans abandon Britain and Gaul, their outer western and northern provinces, but still can't defeat Alaric. And then the river Rhine freezes, and thousands of Germanic tribesmen now cross into the western empire. In 410, Alaric demands to be made consul, and when the emperor refuses, he sacks the city. What's really interesting here is that he wants a Roman title. He wants the title of consul. So it's not as though the barbarians are necessarily trying to destroy the Roman Empire. It's more that they want to have what the, uh, what the Romans have. And the sack of Rome in 410 is a catastrophe that stunned the Roman world. People had seen that things had been getting worse. They'd been told the Roman Empire was weak, but Rome had stood at the center of the world for centuries. The idea that the Roman Empire could be destroyed was something most people even couldn't imagine. And the Romans knew or had lost the will to make any kind of comeback. They knew that this could happen again and again now. One of the important results of the sack of Rome is that the Byzantine Emperor, Anthemius, um, recognizes the perils of the Eastern Empire, and he responds by fortifying Constantinople with massive triple rings, massive walls and triple rings, uh, the largest known fortifications of the time that protect Constantinople from direct assault. And so this assures that while the Western Empire is going to decline and collapse, the Eastern Empire will survive. And it's from this point onwards we start to refer to the Byzantine, the Eastern Empire as the Byzantine Empire, even though the Romans at the time wouldn't have used this name. It's a name that's been applied by historians later on. Move on now to the next slide. Even though Rome had been sacked, the imperial court of the emperor was no longer in Rome. It was in the other Italian city of Ravenna. The Romans could no longer dislodge the Goths, but the Goths were con weren't confident they could take on the Romans either at this point. In 418, the Romans concluded a treaty with the Romans by which they received their own lands in southern France. So they now had economic self-sufficiency. After their long wanderings, they had a king that was recognized by the Romans. And so you have peace between the Romans and the Goths, but you also have this large enclave in the middle of the empire that doesn't pay tax to the emperor. And so the cohesion of the Roman Empire is starting to break apart, and you're starting to see more of a, um, a more individualized society, a more tribal-based society based around land and fighting uh, for the man you hold the land from rather than the centralized government of the Romans. So the Goths and the Romans are united together against the Huns, who are not Christian and are universally feared, and really they just want to raid the empire. Uh, and, so the, um, and so the Goths and the Romans come together to defeat the Huns under the last great Roman general Aetius at the Battle of Chalons in 452. And so the Goths certainly want to maintain some aspects of the empire, its security and its stability, but they simply lack the infrastructure and the knowledge of how to manage an empire of this kind of size. You could argue even if they did, the western half of the Roman Empire no longer had the resources, the culture, the willpower to sustain uh, this kind of structure. And so you find different barbarian groups who are settling across the empire, and uh, the empire is starting to fragment. One group that's especially important uh, are the Vandals, who march through Gaul into Spain and then move on to conquer North Africa. North Africa is the wealthiest province of the empire. So the fact that that's conquered, spun off from the empire, that's not good for the empire. And from here, this is really amazing. The Vandals, who've previously just been an inland people, uh, become an amazing maritime power in the Mediterranean. This is terrible news for the Romans. So much of the Roman economy had been built on preserving the safety of trade across the Mediterranean from pirates. And now the Vandals are unchallenged in the Mediterranean. In 455, they sack Rome again. Uh, this sack is rarely ever talked about, but it's actually a far worse sack than the sack of 410. 
And so this means that the Western Empire really isn't going to recover. Another challenge that's ongoing here is the Vandals and the Visigoths were Aryan Christians. So they're, they're Christians, they're devout Christians, but they've been baptized by Aryan missionaries during the Aryan controversy. And so now we have two Christian religions that are competing and in conflict with one another in the Western Empire as well. Move on now to the next slide. Uh, this is the last slide of the course. One final group that we have to talk about are the Ostrogoths, a small group of Goths who entered the empire around the time of Adrianople. And eventually they united under a leader named Theodoric the Great and they settled in Italy. So we have the Vandals in Africa and Spain, we have the Visigoths in France and Spain, and we have the Ostrogoths in uh, Italy. Aetius uh, is winning lots of battles with, in his alliance with the Visigoths, but eventually he is assassinated and the subsequent emperors are weak and divisive. 476, the leading barbarian general of the Ostrogoths named Odoacer removed the last Roman emperor, Romulus Augustulus. Um, and then in 493, Theodoric defeated and executed Odoacer and became the ruler of what was left of the Western Roman Empire. What's interesting about Theodoric is that in many ways he tried to maintain the Roman Empire. He used a Roman style of government with titles of like senator and consul. He married a Frank, he married his daughters to Visigoths and Burgundians, these other Germanic tribes. And so you can see him trying to maintain the unity of the Roman Empire, but doing it in a Germanic way with these marriage uh, alliances. Um, he was a, an Arian, but he constantly tolerated Catholic Christians. He also built a number of stunning churches in Ravenna, but in the end, his kingdom is going to break apart as well. So in the end, we're going to see the final decline of the Roman Empire. We're going to see the loss, the political unity that the Roman Empire had achieved, uh, the stability and the security uh, that had made possible the learning and artistic achievements uh, of the previous uh, generation. Um, and so there are lots of questions about why the Roman Empire fell, the speed at which it fell, the point at which it actually fell, the effects of the fall. Uh, these are all questions for you, you to think about, questions that I'm probably going to ask on the final, um, but I'm not going to cover them here. Um, but these are questions for you to think about um, as we move on from this course and ways that you can uh, set up uh, and think about the significance of this material moving forward. Thanks so much, and I'll see you for the final.